We've got some fresh new young talent doing some things that I know you haven't heard before. One, two, three, listen. Welcome to Finances, your home for all things financial, investment, money, and lifestyle. Hosted and curated by the very talented team of certified financial planners and Burke Britain Financial Partners. This is episode number 96 of the Finances Podcast, and uh, I've been looking forward to this one. I actually received the bio of our guest today about a month ago, I think it was, and I could relate to so many of the things that were spoken about, so many of the challenges that we're going to address today. So I wanted to welcome, firstly, Delta as my uh, co-host today. Uh, Thanks for coming back on, Delta. And our guest today is Narelle Bartlett-Clark, practice owner and principal psychologist at Well Inspired Psychology. Narelle, thanks for joining us on our little podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Now, Delta, let's maybe just start with the origins of you meeting Narelle, because I think you went to, did you go to a a presentation where Narelle spoke? I was recently at a presentation where Narelle spoke, which I was very impressed by, but our history goes back a fair bit longer than that. Uh, Narelle is a friend of my sister, so I've probably known Narelle since... She took me underage to nightclubs and things. Well, I think I'm pretty sure that Narelle said don't talk about <laughs> nightclubs. <laughs> That's right. What happened in the nightclub stays in the nightclub. That's fair enough. Now, Narelle, obviously there's a lot to talk about in the sort of mental health space, the psychology space. I've got lots and lots of questions, but I, I want to do less talking today. I want to listen to a little bit about your background and where it's led you today in your business. But let's start with your personal background. So where were you born? Where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? I think your schooling's a a fairly extended one. So I was born in Melbourne, Fentry Cully Hospital. I spent the first 10 years of my life in Melbourne and we moved to Geelong following the breakup of my parents' marriage and my mother remarried and she married a guy that was building a house down here. So we ended up in Geelong and I went to a local state primary school here and then we went to high school, which was a state high school, state educated. And then I think after high school, I just kind of didn't really have the confidence. I applied to do psychology. I was a younger age student. So I think I was 17 when I did VCE, Hmm. had a boyfriend at the time. So I wasn't really focused on career or anything and just decided to defer because I just didn't have the confidence to do it. So I went to business college. My mother said to me, if you're not going to go to uni, you need to do something useful. So you're going to go to business college. Actually, that was a really valuable year for me because I learned all about administrative management of a business. So I learned how to touch type. I learned how to do shorthand. I still, I don't know how to do shorthand now. I couldn't do it. And I ended up getting a job as a legal secretary for a local solicitor. Seven months into my first job, he passed away. So sad and unbelievable that that happened. And then the Law Institute came down and they said to me, if you can do conveyancing, like it would be really good if you could step up and and do the conveyancing. So all of a sudden I went from being a receptionist and all of a sudden I was managing the conveyancing in this law firm because the lady that was doing the conveyancing had to step up and kind of help out with the trust account and things like that. Yeah, so that was a crazy time. And then I ended up leaving that job after a while. I just always felt like I need to do something more. Mm Mm-hmm. But I did end up out at Target Head Office. I got a job out there, but they don't call it Head Office anymore. Yeah, it's been a while. What what years were you out at Target? I started there in 1995. Mm. I was 24 at the time. I think I'm giving away how old I am. And I was the secretary to the company solicitor, which was a great few years. I really loved it. It was really good. But the head of HR at the time, he used to come by our desk a fair bit because he'd come in and meet with the company solicitor for whatever reason. And he always used to say to me, have you started that degree yet? Have you started that psychology degree yet? He was sort of on my back a bit and I've never forgotten him because I think at the end of the day, he was the person that really lit the fire in me to go to uni and get it done. So I enrolled and I started on my university course. I think I was 26 when I started. Can I divest just for one? When did you finish at Target? I ended up finishing at Target. I had an interesting journey with Target because I was one of the first wave of redundancies that happened in, it was just before I got married, late 2001. Okay. Did you have, uh, was there a work colleague, Ian Darren? Yes. Yeah. 
Okay. We've just oh, been chatting. Oh, okay, cool. Kari, actually, my, my wife worked at uh, at Target Head Office around the same time as well, worked under Ian, I suppose. Right, um, yeah. And uh, also worked with a few people like Bobby McDougall. I know all these names. Yeah. It was a long time ago. Yeah. yeah. Norelle and I were chatting, you know, prior to starting here on the podcast, today, and we're talking about the fact that redundancy, while it was so difficult at that point in time, really was another catalyst for you, wasn't it, Norelle, to... It to, was. To refocus. So, yes. The day itself was absolutely devastating, but in hindsight, it was a real turning point in my life because it gave me the kick that I needed to finish my undergraduate degree. I had been doing it part-time, working full-time, studying part-time, and this just kind of made me think, well, I just need to put more hours into my degree and knock it over. And it's lucky I did because it is time limited. Like You can't just be doing an undergraduate degree forever. So I finally got that done. I spent a year in another law firm. I went back to another law firm. I wasn't really, again, getting much joy working for somebody else. So I ended up back at Target again. A year after my redundancy, I went back. I rang the new company solicitor who had come in and I said to her, oh, you know, is there anything going? Like, And she goes, oh, yes, yep, come back. So back I went to Target. And it was while I was at Target for the second time that I finished off my honours degree in psychology because in psychology you need to get your undergraduate bachelor's, you need to get your honours degree and then you need to do a master's. So I did my honours degree while I was at Target two days a week and then studying the rest of the time. It was hard because an honours degree is... Am I right in saying that when you completed that you're also pregnant? That was my master's. That was your master's. That was my master's. Yeah, I know. I don't do things by (laughs) heart. So Um, working, pregnant, master's, all at the same time. Yeah. So when I finished at Target, I got a job at Catholic Care as a family and relationship counsellor. And it was during that time that I started doing my master's. And I was one of the first people that went through doing a master of professional psychological practice that was called at the time. And we were, part of the requirement of that was that we would be doing 20 hours face-to-face consulting with people. And I had that because I had the job as the family and relationship counsellor and I was able to learn on the job as well as academically. And that was a really good opportunity. And that was while I was at Catholic Care. And I was at Catholic Care until I had my son. So I had my daughter while I was at Catholic. What year would this be? I'm trying to think. So my daughter was born in 2009. So I think I was at Catholic care for four years before she was born. And then she was two and a half when I had my son. So in 2011, I finished at Catholic care and I had to finish up my master's. So there was, and I had the research component to do. So my supervisor at the time, I remember him saying, we need to, let's get the access to the longitudinal study of Australian children and we'll utilize that data. And that's how I got my master's done. And yeah, I didn't hand my thesis in actually because I was so heavily pregnant that my mother took the hand of my daughter, she was two and a half, and walked my thesis in to uni for me. And then I had my son six days later. Wow, what a moment. Well done. I wouldn't recommend it. It's not actually a nice way to go into having your second child. But yeah, I guess I just felt so compelled to get this done. And to get it done before baby number two come along, because once baby number two comes along, of course, it gets busy. Uh, There's a deadline that's set and you work towards that deadline, don't you? And it's amazing how much you can achieve when you have that. Oh, yeah. And, you know, with the help, my mum's been, you know, a big help. And, you know, hubby was great at the time. So, you know, that's what you need. You need that support. So baby number two arrived. You finished all of your qualifications after, was it some 16 years? 16 years it took. What what was next? So other than being a full-time mum, yeah. how did you think you were going to apply your 16-year education? Did, were you thinking business at that time? Were you thinking, I'm going to go and work for someone in this field? What did you think you were going to do? By then, I kind of knew that I want to go into private practice. And one day, I think Ben was my son. He was close to getting to be a year old, I think. So I was getting ready to go back. And I was just on Psych Exchange, which is a forum where we can look for jobs, psych jobs. 
and I happened to see a job open up for a child psychologist at a local private practice here, which was CMG Psychological Services. So Cheryl Graham? She, yeah, Cheryl Graham. And she had been at Target and I knew her name and I thought, okay, this sounds like it's going to happen. Sort of funny how you just connect with people over your life and you re-engage with them many, many years later. Yeah. It's great. Big shout out to Cheryl. She's fantastic. So I went and met with her and her business model was around me coming on board as a sole trader. So it wasn't really a job interview. It was more, you know, do you want to do this? And that was a big leap for me because I'd never been in my own little business before, but I really liked her business model because it felt like I was still being looked after in a way. It was sort of risk-free for me because she had the reputation. She had a really solid reputation in Geelong and yeah, it just sort of felt like I could come in under her and she could mentor me a little bit as I grew my child psychology wings. And so that's what I did. 2012, I started at CMG as a child psychologist. Imagine how much, you know, you got from that relationship with Cheryl from a, a mentee point of view, but imagine how much she also felt fulfilled in having someone to mentor. So, Yeah, and it was never a formal arrangement. It was mm. just because we were there and, yeah, that was a good few years with her. Like, that was really fantastic. She steered a really good ship. Cheryl probably also did a very intelligent thing in setting up a succession plan so that when she decided that it was time to move on, I think in 2018, is that right? Mm -hmm. You had the opportunity to perhaps buy her business? Yes. Is that the way it worked? Yeah, she came to me and said, just on the quiet, she said, I'm thinking of winding down in a few years. It's time for me to back out and I'm wondering if you're interested. And I don't know whether this is a good part of my personality or not, but I don't knock things back. You know, if an opportunity presents itself, I did have a business mentor once say to me, you have bright, shiny object syndrome. And I kind of do. I don't know what that is. Has it failed you to date, that shiny object? No. Uh, bright, shiny object syndrome. No, it hasn't failed me. No. It's created stress. It's yep. created a lot, you know, of overwhelm at times. But no, it's never failed me. I imagine you're fairly well placed to deal with the overwhelm that you might experience? I think so. Well, I don't know. I try. Like everybody, you know, I can apply some, yeah, psychological strategies, I suppose, mindfulness and things like that. Yeah. Is psychology, and again, I think we'll we'll talk about psychology and the business in a second, but is psychology a little bit like the plumber with the leaky tap or the financial <laughs> advisor that can't look after his own finances? Is it harder? I, I mean, I think I find it's much easier to give other people advice than it is to actually take my own advice. And it, it takes a very conscious and aware effort yeah. to actually detach and think about how you're acting in certain circumstances. Do you find that? Like in those instances, do you find that it's much easier to provide advice rather than take your own advice? Well, first of all, I would say that when you come to a psychologist, we don't really advise people, which is interesting because I think there is a big perception out there that you go to a psychologist and you do get advice, but it's really important for a client to be empowered and to feel the power in their own situation. And sometimes that's what a psychologist is doing, actually helping the client to see where they have their own power in a situation. So in terms of taking our own advice, I kind of would say that's difficult because we would sort of more need to reflect for ourselves. Is there a, this might be a really silly question, but yeah. the distinction between psychologist and psychiatrist, mm -hmm. is that the delineation of advice? A psychiatrist has a medical degree. We don't have a medical degree and a psychiatrist can prescribe medication, which we can't. I think that's another common misconception too, is that we will prescribe medication. So a psychiatrist is like a medical doctor that has a specialty in the brain and mental health around the brain and prescribing medication. And they also do consultations, therapeutic type consultations, but I don't think they are as long as a psychologist consultation. Our consultations are 50 minutes to an hour sometimes. Whereas what we do is we work more with thoughts and beliefs, feelings, behaviours and outcomes that come from that. So let's go back to when you took over the business. We don't want to miss that because it's a fairly pivotal part in your life and yeah. your business progression. So 2018, you took over the business. 
you rebranded the business at that time? I did, yep. yeah. And again, that was on advice of a, a business coach who said to me, CMG Psychological Service, well, CMG was um, Cheryl's initials, and he was just basically saying it's probably a good idea to brand it to something a little bit less to do with a name. It, it just makes it more sellable down the track. <laughs> But I'd had this name in my head anyway, well inspired. Better change the name of the business in Delta. <laughs> We've had that conversation. <laughs> oh, have you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just thinking about succession all the time as we have to. Yeah, we, as yeah, we do. the exit yeah. plan. Yeah. yeah. Well inspired, it became. And that was all done in 2018 or maybe even early 2019 that we rolled it out. And then, of course, I had big plans <laughs> and then COVID hit. So, and everything kind of got put on hold. But 2019, what size was the team at that point in time? I think we had a team of nine or 10 site and I think we had three admin. Yeah. So a practice manager and two receptionists. Yep. So that's fair to say that's grown again from that point in time? Actually, well, see, the pandemic had an interesting impact on our profession. I think more mental ill health became a big thing during the pandemic. And so psychologists became very busy and a lot of us were actually closing our books because coming back to the question that you mentioned before, I think this is why my brain just went in all directions and I couldn't answer, is that we have to look after ourselves and there's a big component of this that we learn right at the early stages from uni right through is our self-care because if we don't look after ourselves and if we're not doing okay, then how can we look after others? It's very similar to the old aeroplane thing, you know, the oxygen drops, mm. fix yourself up first before you offer it to a child. So, yeah, we have to really look after ourselves. And during the pandemic, a lot of us closed our books as a means to kind of keep our boundary and hold the people that we had because we need to ethically, we've got to look after the people that are coming to see us and we need to keep ourselves reasonably healthy for that. So, of course, yeah, there were heaps of clients. We closed our books. It, it created, I think, a horrendous kind of situation for people. But interestingly, psychologists, some, realized that I could go out into my own practice here. I don't have to work hard for clients. I mean, why wouldn't you? It's a time of abundance. So why wouldn't you go out and start something of your own? And my practice, unfortunately, fell victim to that. I did lose a few along the way. So we did reduce in size and I went into survival mode. Like it was all of a sudden I wasn't marketing to clients anymore. It was about marketing to the workforce and trying to build it all up again. And so that's what I've been busy doing over the last couple of years, building it up again. And now I've got fantastic new practitioners who are really eager, ambitious, and, you know, they're really ready to build themselves up and establish themselves. What is it about well-inspired psychology that would attract someone to come and work with you? Well, I was thinking about this. We are a really eclectic mix of psychs. So we're not all pediatric psychs. We're not all trauma psychologists. And there are practices around, rightly so, who specialise, I shouldn't say specialise, who go into those areas and who really focus on those areas and that's great. But we are quite eclectic. We do have some paediatric psychs on board and we do have a couple of trauma psychs. We have people that work in the perinatal space. We have sex therapists. We have a woman who does now, she works with families. She doesn't do family therapy, but she does family consulting. She does couples therapy. So we can offer a lot of knowledge, like we are a real brains trust. And I think that's been very attractive, particularly for our early career psychs who are coming in. And we also have an intern who's gleaning a lot of knowledge from all these different sources. Yeah. And he wants to really grow himself in the area of trauma and men's mental health. To me, that's just so important. I was listening to, maybe it was at the Michael Cargreg. Do we say that on air or off air? So we, Not Delta that, and I yeah. went to see Michael Cargreg at uh, a presentation run by Read the Play. Uh, Michelle Gertz has run not-for-profit organization giving youth youth yeah mental health awareness and methods to i suppose identifying their peers 
if something is not quite right. Well, I suppose the, the question I have being a father of five kids and Delta a uh, mother of three children, we talked about the fact that never before has there been so much focus on mental health and mental health support, Yeah. yet it seems that the mental health, particularly paediatric and young people's mental health, has never been worse. What, again, it's a very broad question on the, you probably don't have the answer, but you've got a, a view on it. What's going on that is leading those two things, the amount of treatment and support that children and people are provided to be going up exponentially whilst the quality of people's mental health appears to be going in the opposite direction? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a huge question. So one thing that I do know is that when people feel disconnected, it's not a good thing. And I feel like just anecdotally, so this isn't based on any research that I've looked at or, or know, and I can only go by what I see in the rooms. And I'm one practitioner in one town in Australia. But what I see is disconnection in a lot of people. They feel disconnected, even though they might be in a crowd, but they feel lonely. So I guess what I'm contemplating as a practitioner is what is that? What is going on that people feel so disconnected from one another? And I have been reflecting lately on, oddly enough, just the loss of, I guess, maybe manners. Manners are a social skill and manners are really important because they show the people around us that we respect them and that we care. There just seems to be this general loss of maybe manners, I think is the word, just general consideration for the person that's sitting in the room with you. And I've witnessed it myself where people will be engaged in conversation in a group and there's one person sitting there quiet and not even being addressed and they don't know what the other people are talking about and people don't draw them in. And look, teenagers can be really guilty of this. They don't know that they're doing it, but they probably maybe haven't really been taught or had it modelled for them. So I think that's potentially one aspect, but there's also possibly things we all know, and there's a big conversation in the media at the moment about mobile phones and the impact that social media is having on people as well. You know, maybe that all bleeds into this sense of disconnection and the comparisons that we're all making or that young people in particular are making about themselves and about others and how they're going and they're not sort of coming up so well in that comparison. I think that contributes to it too. We also have, so trauma is pretty big in our society. And when I reflect on it, I think, again, this is not found in research. I'm just talking anecdotally here, but I do feel like we have multi layers of generational trauma, particularly in this country, but probably worldwide now. We've had the First World War, then they came home and parented a generation, and we had a Second World World War, they came home and parented a generation, you know, Korean War, Vietnam War. But not only that, we've had the depression, we've had the pandemic, like we've got layers of trauma which possibly isn't really being fully addressed nor treated and it just keeps continuing down the generations. That's how I feel. I don't know if it's right. Yeah, it's interesting when I think about it because you're right that over over time there's always uh, periods of catastrophe and traumatic events that happen in a society or in a generation. Mm. I suppose the question is whether or not if those things always happen and they have always happened, you know, what is the point of difference today? And again, I look at it, I'm looking at my own children. I think my own children, I can see elements of, again, this is anecdotal as well, but I can see the impact of technology. I mean, iPhones came around in 2008. I think the like button on Instagram and social media came in at about 2011. And all of those things tend to correlate mm. pretty close with what I've seen from my generation when we all grew up. Mm. The things that we didn't have, we weren't comparing. Well, we were comparing, but we weren't comparing. We're at home in our bed looking at what Delta was doing. I didn't know what Delta was doing. Yeah. There was no method of actually being able to compare. Yeah, it's just so interesting. Again, I'm, that's why I was, I was intrigued about your thoughts on this. I know there was also a quite a controversial clip floating around of a child psychologist Abigail Schreier. I'm not sure whether you saw that, where she was talking about it was argued fairly heavily on both sides about whether or not ruminating on issues 
and actually mm. repeating issues. So this is probably it's, it's almost in contradiction to what we're talking about about having people sharing their feelings. Mm. But her argument was that one of the worst things that people can do is constantly ruminate mm. around their issues. Mm. Now, to me, that was sort of a contradictory when we think about having people share their feelings. Yet she's saying, well, sometimes sharing all of your feelings can just make them continue to be front of mind. Mm. I don't know whether you've got any thoughts on that because that's something that I've thought about. Maybe we're over-talking some of these these issues. And again, I think it's none of these issues are probably binary. Like it's not one or the other. It's like, mm. don't talk about your feelings or you have to talk about your feelings. There's people like you who are skilled in working out when is it that you actually are best to share your feelings and then when at times where you feel like ruminating or going over something with no progress mm. is actually counterproductive. Mm. Absolutely. Like we live in a world of extremes. There's no doubt about that. This world has become extreme in all areas. This is what I see and this is what overwhelms me. And I feel like there's a balance to be struck in most things, including that. So it is about finding the balance and it's different for every person in ruminating and going there. Stopping rumination or do you actually go there? Ruminating is when you go deep into your head and you're really thinking deeply about something that might have happened in the past or something that you're anticipating in the future. And the whole thing is is that thoughts aren't reality, reality I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. So they're stories that we tell ourselves. So when we're ruminating on something that happened in the past that's actually not really in existence anymore, what exists is right here, right now. Mm. So teaching clients how to pull themselves out of rumination can be like a brain break, the brain break that we need. And coming back to the whole thing with mobile phones and phones in bedrooms and phones in our hip pocket, and we don't give ourselves a brain break from any of this stuff. Like it's just with us all the time. That's just my opinion is about finding balance, stopping rumination, but then you do need to acknowledge our feelings, go and speak to someone who knows how to actually respond to you if you're having difficult feelings or difficult thoughts or whatever. Yeah. Is it fair to say that, Narelle, that you empower your clients to consider what's happened in the past, but have them forward focusing on their own mindset around the events that have occurred? Mm -hmm. And I suppose building that resilience to bridge that gap so that they can take control of their own thoughts and then subsequent action. Mm. Yep. It is about helping clients to understand things that might have happened in the past, how they are actually framing that in yep. their mind. What meaning have you gleaned from that? What does it mean about you? What does it mean about the world? What does it mean about a situation? In that, there might be some irrational ideas, ideas that aren't really true that they're holding on to, that they don't even realise that they're holding on to. Sometimes that's a bit of an aha moment when people realise, oh, I've been believing this all this time and actually it's not really, you know, the evidence for it isn't really there. It takes a bit to get to that point though. There's a lot of unpacking to do. And once clients sort of can come to those realisations, then it's about going into potentially a strengths-based model where we talk about, all right, well, what's been working? What strengths do you have? What are the characteristics you can employ to make the future different, forge a different path for yourself? But I'd say all this with full awareness of knowing that there are mental illnesses out that actually do inhibit people from being future-focused. Depression, I'm thinking of, you know, you get a depressed person and it's very hard for them to kind of see possibilities, future possibilities. So that also warrants a different kind of care. That's when we're talking about safety and containment and mm. yeah, creating a safe space until the healing can begin. Makes me think about how, I can't remember where I heard the quote, but that we are meaning-making machines. That's what we do. And I think it's probably a evolutionary imperative that you do. You make meaning because that's how we communicate and that's how we pass on stories. But mm. At some level, it becomes rumination about the past. I've always thought is depression. Like, well, you, if you're feeling depressed, you're generally worrying about things that have happened in the past that maybe you wish you hadn't have done. And then that anxiety or the future focused mm -hmm. is anxiety, mm -hmm. which we all have, mm -hmm. but it's the degree to which you ruminate on them and can't get past that. Yep. And you can't separate your story from reality, mm -hmm. from objective truth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so sometimes... 
it is about getting a bit strict with yourself and catching yourself ruminating and stop. And you can utilize mindfulness. You can utilize your senses to bring yourself back into the current moment. People have favorite places to ruminate too. Some people do it in the car. Some people do it in the shower. So also knowing when you are likely to float off and go deep into your head so that you're aware that this might happen and so that you can wake yourself up out of it and come back into what's real and what's in front of you can give you that brain break. Yeah, yeah. but it's, it's a habit almost that needs breaking, isn't it? Like, a you know, someone that might have been a smoker and they have a drink in one hand, the habit is that the other hand has a cigarette in it, mm-hmm. for example. Like, mm-hmm. as you said, maybe being in the car is the place that you ruminate. So detaching from your thoughts and focusing on the here and now, mm. yeah, and being able to remove that barrier. Well, it is a skill, and it's a skill that you need support with. As you were saying that, I was thinking about what, as financial advisors, like you would ag- agree with this, Delta, we're probably not on your front line, but we're on the front line of just about every single event that happens in people's lives. Mm-hmm. We're at the forefront of people having their first child, owning their first home, starting their first business, mm-hmm. buying a business off someone, death of a loved one, mm-hmm. their parents going into aged care, and all of those things, all of those things cause some degree of mental angst that might be anxiety or depression, or it might be rumination, rumination mm-hmm. about what could be or what should have been. And it's we've almost become, and we're certainly not qualified, but we've almost become pseudo counselors in our own role but one of the things we don't have is the tools that you have and your team have to actually guide people and help them maybe you touched on it briefly before about the types of clientele that come your way and you mentioned some of the practitioners you've got trauma counselors and men's health and uh, pediatrics what are you seeing as sort of the main entry point for people seeking your services or psychological services mm. so i work predominantly with adult women now. I did do about 10 to 15 years with children. I moved away from that after the pandemic. I really developed a liking for perinatal work, but I'm also doing now, I'm noticing through an employee assistance program that we are linked in with, I am starting to see some organisational leaders, CEOs, business owners. And I also love that work too, I think because I relate to it. And it is so important as a leader to feel connected. Again, it comes back to that disconnection. It can be so isolating when you are leading a team and when you are having to hold the candle of hope. For example, if it's feeling like there is little hope or you're carrying all the risk that these people don't realise that you're carrying, it can be a lonely space to be in. So I'm starting to really love working with business leaders and organisational leaders. It's so interesting you say that as a business owner myself and thinking about some of the stresses, I'm very fortunate that we have an amazing leadership team here with Delta and Ben and Amy and Peter and and Brooklyn and a a bunch of others uh, that can help share some of that load. But Delta and I have both sat in front of small business owners who just are at their wits end Mm. and don't know who to turn to, who to talk to about their issues Mm. and also talking to people that actually have real life experience, that have actually experienced some of the same challenges. Mm. Now, this might be a reasonable segue into some of the things that you've got planned at the moment. We wanted to talk about something called the pit. Mm. Oh, yeah. So maybe you want to tell us what the pit is and uh, how it relates to what what you're delivering in terms of uh, services. Sure. So... Because I'm noticing burnout is a really big thing at the moment for many professionals, I would say, many professionals, people in leadership roles, people that are owning businesses, it's been a tough, what, four or five years, really tough. And I'm noticing that there is like a fair bit of burnout. And part of burnout is this thing called imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is that feeling or that sense like, I don't belong. I don't really know what I'm doing. People are going to find out. I'm a phony. It's that sense that I don't really know what I'm doing here. What on earth am I doing? And I think it's really common in people who part of their job to not know the full story. I think part of a profession is that you go to school or to uni and you learn all the theory and then you have to go out in the real world and actually apply that theory to 
unusual situations that come across you. And I liken it to, like I think about the guys, the doctors in the emergency room at, um, at any hospital. They know all of the medical theory. They know all of the procedures that they have to do. But then all of a sudden an ambulance pulls up with a patient who has a really unusual, let's just say there's a touch wood that this doesn't happen, but let's say there's been a car accident and someone's, I don't know, got a bone protruding through somewhere and they haven't actually worked with that before. They have to apply everything they know. They have to lean on their colleagues and they have to do what it is that they can do to sort that situation out. And I feel like it certainly happens in psychology too. We have been talking about this with my intern recently. We armed with, you know, we know the theories, we know the therapies, but then along comes somebody and they don't quite fit the box. And our role is to put ourselves in what I call, it's just my term, the pit, which is this pit of not knowing. It's like this space of, well, I know what in theory will work, but it's not necessarily right for this person. And I need to kind of sit with this person and figure it out. You probably get it in financial planning as well. I know teachers experience it. Yeah. So I think what I've got, what I would like to do and what I have got in the wings, but I've, of course I'm building content, is I would like to do my own podcast at some time and talk about all this stuff. Talk about how it is for professionals, business leaders, but also creatives, people who are creative. Also, it's part of their job to put themselves in this pit of not knowing. And this is what we get paid for um, to figure it out, to put ourselves in that space of, I don't know what I'm doing. I feel like a fraud, but I'm going to sit with this and try and figure it out using my colleagues, what I know, and do the best I can. You ever feel like you've had imposter syndrome, Delta? <laughs> yeah, I can absolutely relate to being in that position. As you said, Narelle, for us in this profession, you know, we have all the tools, skills and knowledge, and then we have clients that sit in front of us that are different on every occasion. And it's applying those skills that we have to that client that sits in front of us, which is different every time. But I really relate to the pit because it also reminds me of a quote that's been delivered lots of different ways, but effectively it's somewhere around if you're not in some form of discomfort, you're not growing. Mm. If you always know the answer, then you're not actually progressing as a person. Yeah. And that cuts to the whole thing is that as professionals, as creative people, as entrepreneurs, we are lifelong learners. We never fully know the job. We're always learning. There's stuff. I have colleagues who have been in the industry far longer than I have, and they're still learning. And sometimes they learn something off me. And I think, oh, really? Did I just teach you that? And sometimes I learn stuff off my intern and I think, oh my gosh, that's great. We think of another quote, I can't remember the attribution, but the person who knows everything has got a lot to learn. Hmm. It's actually refreshing when you realize that there is so much that you don't know and that it's actually okay. And that that journey gets overused a little bit, but that journey of gaining knowledge is never ending. Hmm. Like it, it never stops. Like you can just can continue to open a book uh, or re listen to a podcast or read something or learn something every day. And when, as you said, Delta, you start to think about that lack of knowledge or that something that you don't understand as a challenge that you can overcome, it actually becomes a, a positive thing. You're not thinking, I don't know, therefore I will sort of shy away from this. You think, actually, this is great. Something new to learn. Yep. I don't know it. And then being honest, I think it, the worst situations I find is when people pretend they know something that yeah. they don't know and uh, it's pretty see-through. But the, the best circumstances are where someone says, listen, that's, that's a good question. I've got no idea, but I can find out. I'll, I'll certainly look it up. I'll research it and I'll find out. And I really relate that to like a potential client that comes to see us, Jay. Like sometimes I feel like that initial meeting, they sort of leave with their head spinning a little bit because they realize that there's so much that they don't know that they are going to have to trust other professionals that do know to help them with. Mm. And that's ultimately they recognise in this instance financial planning for you, Narelle, mental health, that they can't do it themselves. They need some support. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree with that. And part of leaning on us is to understand, and I think this is where we feel pressure, because to understand that we're on the journey with you, like we're bringing our textbook knowledge and our experiential knowledge they're for, if, certainly in my industry for psychology, they're bringing their lifetime knowledge. And that is so rich and so informative. Like I would never sit in front of a client and perceive myself as being the expert 
in their situation. I'm just not. I've got some textbook knowledge. They've got some really rich and important life knowledge. And so together we work towards how do we put you on a path that's more comfortable, more joyous, I guess, is the word. So it'd be fair to say that connection yes. is the thing that brings about connection. change. Connection is everything in mental health. I can't stress that enough. Like this is the thing that it's our spirit, our relationship that does the healing. A client can come into me and say, I need tools for sleep and I can hand them the tools, but then they've got to go home and actually be able to apply it when they've got kids that aren't sleeping or, you know, there's so many situations in which people struggle to sleep. So it's not just that. It's also, well, let's also sit down and have a chat about your general well-being and your sleep hygiene and, you know, all those sorts of things. Let's talk about your mental health because maybe your mental health is affecting your sleep. Can I ask a question there? When you're having those conversations, I know you said before that you're not giving advice, but what mm. in those instances where someone's having horrible sleep patterns, mm. like what is it that you're trying to unearth, have them see in their themselves mm-hmm. to actually help support them towards finding a an outcome or a positive outcome? Mm. How do you think about it when you actually do sit down with a client for the first time? Yep. So how I think about it is, okay, textbook-wise, what do I know here? All right, so I might talk to the client a little bit about what I know, which is about sleep hygiene for a start. And sleep hygiene, for those that maybe don't know, is about all of the things that you do to promote sleep. Now, some people have never even thought about this. Things like having a specific bedtime routine. And so many people don't these days. Hopping off your phone getting away from blue lights. Now, fish tanks in bedrooms too, that's a form of blue light. Think about where is the blue light that's stimulating your brain. Did you say fish tanks in the bedroom? Yeah. Have you got a fish yeah. tank in your bedroom, Delta? <laughs> no, I'm thinking waterbed or something. <laughs> some, some kids do. Some okay, kids, oh, kids, of course. They'll have yes, a yes, fish yes. tank and it's got like a blue ultraviolet yep. light. <laughs> <laughs> we went <laughs> elsewhere. <laughs> I was picturing like a, an inbuilt, Water, fish tank in the wall of oh, my bedroom. I thought, oh, that'd be, that'd be cool. Yeah. I'd like one of those. Yeah, that's what the rich people say. So, sorry, Narelle. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, I was thinking more like um, with children, but any kind of source of blue light can cause sleep issues. So that's yep. not good sleep hygiene. Things like getting into your PJs at a particular time. Other things that promote good sleep is um, not having too much coffee. You know, they're quite simple things that we all kind of know. But when you frame it with a client in terms of, well, you know, sleep hygiene, this is what it's called, what is your routine? And when you actually get them to sit down and start thinking about their routine, they come to their own realisations. People are very intelligent. They can come to their own realisations. Whether they want to see it or not, that's another thing. It's kind of the best way to have people come around to a conclusion is to have them make that realisation themselves rather than telling it. Most of us don't respond very well to being told your sleep's shit and yeah. you should stop drinking coffee. Yeah. If they see it themselves, yep. it's a different, yep. appreciated in a different the way. Indirect approach, Jay, is that's how it. we would oh. refer to it. Correct. Yeah. So that's on sleep. What are other, some of the other sort of hygiene measures for sort of personal well-being that even, maybe some listeners, I know we're not providing advice, mm-hmm. but what are some of the other hygiene measures people can think about in taking care of themselves that ha- actually have a significant impact on mental health? Again, Delta and I, I'd say we're probably pretty well versed in this, but I'm sure there's a lot of people, I've spoken to a lot of people who the simple hygiene factors in their life just aren't that self-evident. So what sort of tips could you give people thinking about that? Oh, look, there is so much. Work-life balance comes to mind. Again, this is coming back to this life of extremes that we have. And I think there's a lot of people at the moment that are still really trying to forge that work-life balance coming off COVID and everything and coming back into stabilising what's normal. I think it's been in the forefront of a lot of people's mind to try and find the right balance there. I think in in terms of like little psychological strategies that we can adopt to look after ourselves, applying mindfulness, bring yourself back to the here and now. If you find yourself becoming overwhelmed by what's happening, you know, down the track, come back to today. Just exist in today if you have to, just for a while. You know, sometimes we can be future focused when we're holding our anxiety just fine, but sometimes we're not holding it just fine. And we need to tell ourselves just, you know, come back to today and exist in today. Breathing, there's like relaxation techniques. Diaphragmatic breathing is really important. 
seems woo-woo, doesn't it? I, if you asked me 20 years ago about breathing, now it's something that uh, it's front of mind for me every time I'm you know feeling a little stressed, just taking the time to have some nice, slow, deep breaths. Yeah. It, yeah. And it makes a difference. It changes your state. It really does. It, it impacts the body in such a positive way when you're breathing in a way that that has that um, maximum oxygen effect. So, and that's as simple as I can teach you it right now if you want to know. Yeah, let's do it. Go for it. Put a hand on your chest. Yep. On my hand, chest. Yep. One on your chest, one on your stomach. Yep. And when you breathe, see if you can make the hand on your stomach move in and out more than the hand on your chest. It's about relaxing those stomach muscles and seeing if you can. Now, for some people, I do want to say this, some people it takes a while to learn. And other people can do it straight away and both is normal, both is okay. I would say to clients, and it's always just an invitation to consider, it's never me telling them what to do, but um, I would invite clients to consider doing that every time they're at a red traffic light. Practice your diaphragmatic breathing. You can get into that habit. You're not doing anything else at a red traffic light. (laughs) So yeah, just practice your diet, check in, what's my breathing doing? Diaphragmatic breathing can be so helpful with anxiety because it calms the whole body down immediately. Singers do it. I think that's the breathing that they have to learn when they're singing. Is that sigh reflex that, you know, when you go, Mm. is that your body like sort of automatically saying, you need to take a big deep breath in? Look, I don't know for sure. Someone out there would be probably quite on the ball about that. I would assume that it's that I need more oxygen. And it is quiet when you think about it after a sigh. It is kind of a bit, you do have that relaxation kind of feeling, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, that definitely. Is. Yeah. It's uh, the nose breathing technique versus the mouth breathing too. That's a whole nother podcast series. Yeah. But yeah, it's really interesting. And it's really interesting to hear you talk about those strategies, Narelle, because having three young children, like they're learning mindfulness at school and they're having brain breaks and breathing sessions and like it's just so reassuring to know that they're actually being armed with the skills that perhaps our generation weren't. Yep. Yeah. And whether that's just because there's a greater focus on wellness in the education system now, perhaps. Yeah. I'd like to think so. Yeah. I mean, I see it too in my kids' educational lives. I think um, at this primary school that my kids went to, they'd have, after the bell went and they'd come in before they'd sit down to their lesson, they'd have what was it, like a, a two or three minute meditation time, mindfulness time? It was lovely. Chime time, I think they called it. Sounds like something we could introduce here, Jay. Yeah, let's have it. So we, we actually did. I, during COVID times, we actually did have, when everyone was working at home, we had some relaxation sessions and uh, we were all on Zoom. I remember missing, I was awake for like the first two minutes and then as soon as we started deep breathing, I was out. Like I was just, uh, I was away with the fairies. So, But it is so important. I mean, we do get so caught up like back to the idea of uh, burnout and stress and balance, like we get so caught up in the day-to-day and we just fail sometimes to take that time to look after ourselves. And again, breathing, sleeping, eating well, exercise, the basic sort of hygiene factors that people can start with, it's so important. And then uh, knowing that they do then have supports beyond that. I was thinking, what are some of the, maybe the top three reasons broadly that you see people that are most on people's minds at the moment because I was thinking about financial stress obviously Mm. there's uh, we talked about business owners and people wearing that all that responsibility rising interest rates rising inflation cost of living all putting pressures do you see that like is that in the top three concerns that people have at the moment or not it is probably in a vicarious way. So, okay, the top three I would nominate would be depression, anxiety, stress. They would be the three things that people are coming in for. Oh, probably trauma as well, I beg your pardon. Trauma is a big one. Do people in sort of subcategories of those, do people are thought about sort of anxiety? Mm. Is anxiety in terms of a subcategory around financial anxiety or is it just a broad anxiety? Financial anxiety is from what I see, very much a part of it. I think it's really prevalent right now. Hmm. It's a big thing for people. What I'm seeing, the common story themes in terms of workplace stuff is that people are being required to do more for not as much as what they used to be rewarded. So I think that 
harps back to financial pressure because it's financial pressure on businesses and on organisations to perform and keep profitable. I mean, why else are we here if we're not profitable? Stay profitable and get the work done and get the service or the product delivered. And that, of course, then puts pressure on the people that are in that organisation to perform and get stuff done. And that's one of the reasons why they're coming to see me at the moment. One of them, yeah. You're so feeling so under pressure. It's the business owner or the people that are working within the business as well? Yeah, it's both. This is where I really feel for business owners right now because they are under enormous stress and they are at the top of the tree. Culture kind of trickles down from them. Like there's so much responsibility that they're holding, but they are also under duress. You know, it's not like as if they're tiptoeing through the tulips. There's probably some large, massive organisations out there where it's a bit of a different story. But I'm talking about, you know, mother and father business owners that I would sort of see in my practice. That's Mm. what I'm noticing. Do you think that can be improved via connection, as in building the relationship amongst that small business? Mm. And perhaps each of those two different parties having a greater understanding of you know, their current experience of either the small business owner and the challenges that they face and the employee and the challenges that they face? Mm, Yeah, I think so. Yeah. How nice it would be if we could all just understand each other a bit better. I'd probably be out of a job. Well, it sounds like uh, better communication, doesn't it, Dalton? Thinking about it as a small business owner, one of the things that Peter in our business did very well early on was avoid being having the business solely reliant and dependent upon him. Mm. They built essentially a, a business that had was fairly decentralized, that areas of responsibility and leadership were yeah. didn't hang on to those. He actually sort of gave them up in favor of actually sharing load and responsibility, mm. but also understanding. It allowed everyone in the business to understand where we were headed mm. and it wasn't just captured in one person's mind. Because mm. I think that sounds great when you start a business, you go, yep, I want to be in charge, I want to be in control, I want to call the shots, it's going to be my yeah. business and it's going to be my culture. And as soon as you start to have a bit of tenure in business, you realize that's actually a horrible idea. Like it's actually a much better idea mm. to actually build a group of people around you that share in a common vision, yeah. and share the load and responsibility. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things that we have never got perfect in business, but we strive for every day is to make sure that we explain to our team why we're here and how they impact the greater goal and how they can contribute. Because that back to making meaning of us being meaning making yes. machines is that we all come to work and we have, for whatever reason, have spent a lot of our working lives in businesses. Yes. We want to have yeah. meaning, positive meaning. We want to actually feel like we're achieving something towards a positive end because life is finite and it's not going to last forever. So the time we've got here, we want to enjoy. Absolutely. It is so important to have a purpose to what we're doing. And coming back to the reasons why people are coming through to talk to me at the moment on work-related stuff, people are getting drowned with bureaucracy, paperwork, red tape, and the meaning is getting lost. It's like, why am I here? Because I am just drowning in paperwork and having to prove myself and why I'm here. And I really think that's impacting people. But I don't know. It all feels very helpless. I'm feeling the helplessness. We have this thing in therapy where we feel what our clients are feeling. And I'm feeling the sense of helplessness and being bogged down along with my clients. And I'm reflecting very deeply on that because I'm trying to figure out how do we help people with that because it feels it's big and heavy and it is taking away that sense of purpose. So again that ability to detach and look more objectively perhaps at the situation and the things that we can control. Yes we do that quite a bit in well in my room I'm we are always looking at what are the things that you can control here what are the bits that you can't control and How do you release those? How do you just give it up to the universe and focus on the things that are in your control? And honestly, some people don't have a lot that's in their control. It's alarming. Some of them really can't see that there's much in their control. Do you mean they can't see it or they genuinely don't have it? Some people genuinely don't have a lot and some people can't see that they have a lot. Okay. It's interesting because I've always sort of felt and even the conversations with my kids is that I try and reinforce the fact that there's a lot more in the control yeah. 
then they actually can see. And it, sometimes it, it feels like there's things that are significantly out of your control. And even you know when my kids use terms like it's big or it's heavy or it's yeah. overwhelmed, trying to actually understand like objectively what's actually happened. And again, I, I'm probably err on the side. I'm more on the objective side. Less on the feeling L- side, Jay. Maybe, yeah. And my personality profile yeah. would probably say that. Although, yeah. I mean, I, I am empathetic, but I'm also quite objective. My wife would say that I'm probably more objective and maybe stoic in the way I think about things. But at the same time, like people's reality is their reality. Mm. And so if someone yep. feels like that everything is out of their control, yeah. it, telling them, oh, it's up to you. There's not going to help. Like yeah. that's where the that's fine right. line of actually say, r- trying to encourage people to understand what actually is in their control. Mm-hmm. And as people build that muscle, mm-hmm. that muscle of saying, actually, there's a bunch of stuff that actually is in my control. I can influence the people around me. I can change my state. When people realise they can actually change their way of being and how they feel, it's a game changer. Mm-hmm. And that's why your services are so valuable for the people that actually need it. So this might be a nice way to close out and talk about how people, maybe small business owners or people feeling like they need to be in the pit, how can they reach out? How can they find you? You can find me at wellinspired.com.au. You can email us, admin at wellinspired.com.au, or you can phone us, 03 5229 and that's how people can reach out and find us. Are you on all other social yeah. media, LinkedIn? You know what? We're just starting an Instagram page. I've just got it up last night, okay. believe it or not. Cool. Yep. So Well done. Do you know what the handle is? Yes, it's uh, at well-inspired-psychology or underscore. Underscore. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. No worries. <laughs> and very soon there'll be a podcast up and running. I was just about yes. to say that. Oh, cool. yeah, I'm... We don't want to put any stress on you, yeah. but where should we expect this podcast and oh, when can okay. Delta and I come on as guests? Oh, I'd love that. Look, I would like to have this up and running like within the next six months for sure. I'm really thinking deeply about my content and can... I want to get it right. You know, I don't want to can... just do this half measure. All right. Can I make a suggestion? Yeah. Someone who's done a podcast before yeah. and someone who thought about I'm doing learning. the podcast yeah. for five or six years before I actually did it, Yeah, I would say start it. So you can record things and not put them to air. Yeah. You can actually try stuff and if it's no good, I've got about five early podcasts that we did that will never see the light of day because they are absolutely God awful. But I would suggest that uh, you start yeah. in terms of setup or well, you're looking around at this setup here, there's a few phones, there's some $5 Kmart tripods. The most expensive thing is probably the recorder, but you do it on your phone. You can do it on your computer. I would say start, don't wait, start, mm-hmm. get a guest, some interesting people that you want to speak to and just yeah. hit record, talk, and you'll find your way through it. Yeah. Now, we can't let Narelle go without touching on her other passion. This is her penmanship. Is that what we'd say? That's exactly right. Yep. So uh, you're an author as well. I'm not published. I write. Yeah. I'm trying to get published. Seems like my kind of book too. Historical romance. Historical romance, that's it. Wow. Is that the correct genre? Look, it could. I actually think it's more... It said fantasy romance. Yeah, it's a fantasy romance, but it's grounded in a historical setting. And I still can't believe I'm sitting here think, saying that I've written this. It has nothing to do with psychology. It's just a folly of mine that it was really a self-care project, I think that I started during lockdowns. Uh, No, it was just before lockdowns. I'd had some surgery and I was recovering from surgery and I thought, how am I going to sit still for six weeks? You know, what am I going to do? Oh, I'll start writing that story that's been in my head for about, you know, 10 years. I was going to ask that you started with an idea that had been bubbling around for a decade or more. Okay. Where did the original, where did that idea come from? So, yeah, I can remember I'd just had my daughter. She's now 15, so that's how long it's been forming in my head for. And I couldn't sleep, sleep deprivation, all the stuff that comes along with that. And to soothe myself from getting distressed over the fact that I couldn't sleep, I used to say to myself, all right, just lie here and lie still and just make up stories and distract yourself from the fact that you can't sleep. And at the time, Pirates of the Caribbean, I think, had just come out or there was another one coming out. And I love Johnny Depp. But, Who doesn't? Yeah, Johnny Depp's a great character actor, isn't he? He's a handsome man. <laughs> Always. But his portrayal of Jack Sparrow was absolutely fantastic. And at the same time, I thought to myself, the world needs a far more brutish pirate than that. 
And then at the same time, the first season of Game of Thrones came on to TV. and That's oh, romance, isn't it? So not romantic. <laughs> There's some romance in it, you could say. But I did discover Jason Manoa as the Carl. You're lucky you're sitting down. You look, you went a bit weak in the knees there. <laughs> He's another handsome man. He's a strapping, man. beautiful man. Yeah. Carl Drogo. Yeah, he was like this sort of animalistic, brutish kind of guy. I thought, yeah, the world needs a pirate like him. Okay. So this is where my character started forming. And at the time, he was bad. He was a bad boy. And initially, my story was all about this rivalry between my main character, who had to be an opposite to him. So she's like this lady... It just sounds pretty weird. But anyway, and they were going to have this rivalry over this money. It had to be over money because that's what pirates are interested in is a fortune. And that's where it all started. But then in, I think, about 2014 or 15, I think it was, another actor came onto my radar and I just thought, yep, yeah, no, that now I know Jack fully. Now I know my pirate fully. And so he's very much inspired by those three men. Who was the third uh, one? The third one is Sam Hewen. So he's on Outlander. Outlander. You know, you know all about this, Delta. I know from Narelle's Facebook page. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. I've never seen Outlander. I've never seen Game of Thrones. And I've never watched Pirates, uh, of, the Pirates of, the Caravan. of the Caravan. But I know who they are. You're not the target audience, Jay. You're not the target audience. That's okay. Oh, I'll, I'll buy it for Kari for her birthday. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to send me an early manuscript, we'll, uh, we'll happy to read it and give some feedback. I've had lots of readers give me feedback. It's been great. So good. So And sometimes brutal feedback, which has been really it's good. It's type, yep. Yeah, it's apps, uh, there is no failure, only feedback. And it's really helped me to, like, I think I wrote it in, what was it, 2019 and 20, and I have spent the rest of this, the years editing, editing mm. and going over and adding layers, adding personality, yeah, adding bits and pieces, it's working on my um, writing, which has needed, you know, a lot of work. But yeah, I'm really excited. I entered it in a competition recently and it's a finalist. So that's exciting. That's absolutely yeah, exciting. Give yeah. me a boost. Yeah. What it says to me is how, like how many people out there have thought, I love to write a book mm. and it just, it stayed as a thought in their head and there's never been an action that they've actually taken. So hats off to you for actually putting the time and effort and energy into doing that. I'm looking forward to read it. I will read that when you send us a copy. We've talked about where people can find you, talked about uh, your book, which I'm sure will be up on the website at some point in the future. I had one last sort of rapid fire question before we close out, and it was kind of business finance related, which was, what's the best bit of advice, financial or otherwise, that you've ever been given? The best advice I've ever been given would be, the one that's with me now is just do it. Yeah. Mm. Beautiful. I think that's a great way to close out. Narelle, thanks so much for the chat. It's been great. We've been going for a little bit over an hour. I think we could definitely organise a round two and talk about any other of the topics we've touched on today. Delta, do you want to say anything before we close out? Just to thank Narelle for coming in today. Thanks for having me. It's been great. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you're keen to understand more about how financial advice could benefit you, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at FP or Google Burke Britain Financial Partners, check out our client reviews, testimonials, and make a time to meet one of our certified financial planners by clicking book now on our website. Thanks for listening. Any information contained in this podcast is of a general nature only. No account was taken as to the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. Therefore, before making any decision, listeners should consider the appropriateness of any information with regard to their particular objective, financial situation, needs, and seek independent advice from a licensed professional specific to their circumstances. All right, hit it. That translates to don't be a moron and act on what some random person says on a podcast. Take personal responsibility, do your homework, ask questions, and speak to an actual human that knows what they're talking about before you do anything. PP Financial Solutions Proprietary Limited Trading with Burke Britain Financial Partners are authorised representatives of AMP Financial Planning Limited AFS license number 232706.